right? So, so sort of like coefficients from linear regression apply to all observations, right? So that's one. So um, a lot of the work is really focused um, around local interpretability in terms of understanding complex machine learning. So why would we want that? Well, we want to understand why a prediction is say a classification example positive or negative, right? So I train a model, you give me an observation and say, does this, is this tumor cancerous, right? I can give you a prediction, but you don't want to know why that tumor is cancerous, right? A couple reasons. One, if I give you some reasons and they don't make any sense, you're probably not going to trust that model. You might probably not going to trust that prediction and you're might not, not going to take action on it. But if you can take it to somebody who's got like really good domain ex ex expertise and they say, that makes a lot of sense, you're probably going to go with that prediction, right? And say, okay, now we have uh, confidence that the model is working, we can run with it. Um, another thing is provide guidance for intervening strategies. So going back to that can cancer example, right? There may be a few different causes of cancer, and the model can come back and say, we think that this, this, this is the, the reason why this, this tumor cell is cancerous. That might actually inform your treatment strategy, right? If different causes of cancer have different treatment strategies, then you might say, oh, that's interesting. It looks like this particular observation is being caused by this factor, and we treat those types of uh, cancers with this factor. So, so these are other reasons why we might want to actually have just local interpretability, why that might be a good thing. Um, and, and generally, these, these problems have been starting to, are starting to get addressed in the literature, so I'm going to go through some details uh, on those um, in a minute. Um, but just a quick example, are, are the Intuit guys here? So, I, um, <laughs> how's it going? So actually, when I posted this talk, I got an email from them and they said, hey, great, we've been working on this problem um, ourselves. And in the, the context of that problem, I sort of wrote, just copy and paste it, is that uh, they're trying to make fraud in some of their products, right? And if something's at risk of fraud, they send it to a human to actually investigate and say, hey, is this, like, you know, like, is something fishy going on here? Now, you could just send them a prediction and say, go investigate it. Or you could send them a prediction and say, these are the things we think look fishy. Why don't you go investigate those particular things to sort of provide guidance? So that just, like, makes a lot of sense. That's something you, good you want out of your model. Um, for us, one of the examples we have is dealer churn. So we run a subscription business. When dealers cancel with us, that means we don't have money coming in, that's a bad thing. So we have a model that predicts the likelihood that any dealer is going to churn, but you don't just want to go to a salesperson and say, that dealer is likely to churn, go fix the problem, right? You generally want to say, these are the reasons why we think, so you might want to actually address that when you're talking. So again, um, reasons why local interpretability, being able to explain why some observations or a sort of set of similar observations are likely um, to, to, to do something or not do something based on your model. Um, global interpretability, it's really sort of been ignored. Um, I think one of the things that would really benefit from having a sort of global understanding of a model is if you understand the relationship between your X's and your Y's on a sort of more systematic level, you can use that to design products. So if there are systematic reasons over and over again that, that fraud's coming up or dealer trends coming up, then you can go and address that in your products, right? You can come up with business solutions that try and head off that problem before they, they can, uh, before they actually sort of uh, come about. So I think global interpretability is interesting. Um, it's not really addressed in any of the literature, so I'm not going to talk about it. But if, if, if this is sort of a problem that interests people, um, sort of looking at, at, at not just local problems, but how do, how, do the, how do these sort of more complex models relate to outcomes over the entire space, then um, come chat with me after. But uh, I, I think there's sort of uh, not much attention has been received, and it, it's fairly right. Um, so so I, I'm going to sort of play with a toy example here. I think you guys probably know where this is going. Um, <laughs> We've got some raw data. Class zero is didn't survive. Class one survived, and I'm going to predict it with three different uh, features or predictors of um, your class. Whether you're a first class, second class, or third class passenger, um, whether you're male or female. Here, one is female, two is male, and your age. Has, has everyone in this room done this example? I think most people have probably looked at this. Okay, so. Um, you can run a logistic regression. You can get some coefficients. This is very interpretable. What it's saying is, uh, as your class gets worse, you are more likely to die. As your gender goes from male to female, you are more likely to live. Sorry, let me flip that. As your gender goes from female to male, you're more likely to die. And surprisingly, as your age increases, you're more likely to uh, 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 to, to survive. So. Age increase is more likely to survive. Does anyone see any sort of issues with this? Anything that doesn't make sense from these results? More likely to survive. Okay, sure. Hmm. But like, just looking at the, co the, the, the signs of the coefficients. Anything you might say, oh, that's kind of fishy. The yeah. features probably aren't linear. Yes, so yeah. age, for example, right? Yeah. You probably expect very young people to survive, right. very old people to survive, and somewhere in the middle, probably not so much. Right. So you've got some nonlinear effects. 
Um, one other effect that I sort of discovered playing around with it, and I apologize for the like, um, not pretty plots, but um, essentially what we have here is females in first class survive 96% of the time, females in second class survive 91% of the time, and females in third class survive 46% of the time. Right? So going, the difference between first and second class for females isn't that large, but there's a big drop going from second to third. For men, it's actually a different pattern. Right? So, for men in first class, you survive 40% of the time. For men in second class, it's 15% of the time. And men in third class, 15% of the time. So the difference is actually going from first class to second class. So what we call that is an interaction term. Right? So the effect of survival by going from different classes is actually contingent upon your gender. Right? If you're female, going from third class to second is a huge jump. If you're male, going from second to first is where the huge jump takes place. So that's actually an interaction term. Not also not picked up by the logistics. Um, so, one of the packages that's been sort of, uh, um, probably the most popular one is Lime. It's a Python package, locally interpretable model agnostic explanations. Um, it was mainly created for images and text, but um, it claims to be model agnostic. They have a tutorial on tabular data, they say it'll work. So I sort of applied it. Um, what they do is they focus on one observation at a time, okay? And then they sample other observations around it, weighted by the distance of those observations. Um, they compute the sort of in a classification model, f of z, which is the likelihood they survive. Um, they select a subset of features using lasso and then run a, uh, run a uh, least squares regression on those um, f of z's. And the co they claim the coefficients from those uh, regressions are actually the sort of locally interpretable model. So what's going on there? This red cross is the observation we care about, right? And here the complex classification boundary is actually pink versus blue. So if you're in pink, you're a plus. If you're in blue, you're a circle, right? This is clearly like a very sort of nonlinear, funky thing, right? Um, the observations they're gonna sample are the pluses and circles. They're, all, they're weighted by their size. And then they sort of, they, what they do is they, uh, um, you know, run lasso, select some features. They claim that this dotted line is the results of uh, the least squares regression, right? And so locally, around this particular point, it's linear. The whole, the whole model itself is not linear, but just locally right here it's linear. And so they claim that, all right, just in this local space we have a linear model and, and the coefficients. Is it, does that sort of make sense? Okay. Some blank stairs. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is sort of what the results of the model look like. Um, what we have is, uh, so this is sex is two, so these are the actual values of the features. So two men, age 35, one in second class, one in third class. Um, what this is saying is both have a strong negative effect for being male. So being male really decreases the likelihood they survive. Um, for the third class, uh, the second class gentleman, the effect of class is negligible, but for the third class gentleman, the effect of class is, 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 is negative and really strong. And, and this is actually surprising to me because, as you saw, second and third class men both survived at a low rate. So, it's not entirely clear to me how Lyme is handling this particular case, whether it's something about um, how, how, how you're, you're sort of um, dealing with, with uh, ordinal features that go up and down, but, but something's funky there and it, it, it doesn't seem quite right. So, so that's sort of um, um, a little weird. If, uh, if you did the same thing for women, um, you actually see the same exact effect. And this is even given that, so we have a, a second class and a third class, and we see the same pattern where third class is negative, whereas second class isn't. Um, and so, given that we know the, the effect of class change from third to second is different for men to women, you, wouldn't ex you shouldn't expect to see those, those same results. So, it, I'm not entirely sure that the, the paper isn't that detailed, what calculations it's doing, but um, it, it's sort of not a good result um, from this toy example. Um, so, so, it's sort of some shortcomings. It, 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 it's sort of a good out-of-the-box solution, right? If you just need to run a model and get some sort of quick interpretable results, I would say go with Lyme. Um, but it, um, it doesn't really allow you to control um, the local space, sort of how wide you're sampling from, or, or you know, sort of what, what particular values you're, you're comparing against. Um, and I think you might need to center and scale the features because there's a distance calculation going involved uh, when you're weighting the features. And, and uh, I don't know exactly how it's handling that for, say, categorical features in a tree-based model. Um, so another, the other, the other one I'm going to talk about is Icebox. Um, so what Icebox does, um, it's similar to a sort of partial dependence plot. Um, the issue is, but it's more of a general, uh, generalization. So they take one feature, they take one observation, and they say, let's calculate the probability of an outcome 
at every single possible value of that feature for that observation. Right? So if you're a third class male, we'll calculate your likelihood of surviving as a second class male and a first class male. Right? Um, and sort of the average of all those is the partial dependence plot. Um, so if you look at the gender example, what you end up saying is that um, going from female to male decreases your odds of survival. That makes sense. Um, for some people, it's act for most people it's negative, but for some people it's fairly flat. So then it's sort of interesting, all right, well, where would that possibly be the case? Maybe for first class, maybe for third class. You could probably dive in and investigate that further. But what you see is the, the effect of gender doesn't appear to be negative for everyone, which is surprising. Um, when you break it out by class, it's the same sort of thing. Going from first class to second class to third class, you're less likely to survive, right? But for some people, moving from first class to second class doesn't really decrease your survival probability that much. Probably women. Whereas some people it decreases a lot, probably men. And then you can see, for some people, second to third really doesn't decrease that much, and you see some funky behavior. But a lot of people, you see a drop, which are also probably women. So if you were actually able to change the color by a gender, um, all right, I'm getting the wrap up, um, then, then, then that's sort of interesting, right? So, so you're starting to get a sense of, okay, how, are, how is this, this was a random forest, how, how is this actually picking up these patterns? Um, so I have some ideas, I'm not gonna talk about them. If you guys are interested in this stuff, come chat with me later. Um, but, uh, you know, help, these are problems that I think can really benefit a lot of people and they're not really being addressed. That's my email, come get my card. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll post this here, a bunch of links to some of the, a lot of the stuff. Um, one last thing, Edmunds is an awesome place to work. Uh, you can see it's an awesome space, so if you're ever looking, um, send me an email and we'll chat. Thanks.
And yeah, there are some more slides, but it's more like backup slides. So I want to start actually with like uh, how many of you are have done machine learning and deployed it in production? Quite quite some. So maybe I don't know, 20 people. So everything here will be very boring for you, I guess. <laughs> how many of you have played with machine learning? At least trying out some modeling. So I don't know, maybe 30 people, 40 people. All right. So. Uh, Let's go over this kind of process. And as I said, I, I, I could talk for two hours or even more. And I also <coughs> know about at least five, maybe even ten people in LA who can talk about this thing. So my thing today will be very high level. I might not even go into what language to use or anything like that. And uh, I'm actually thinking now of doing like a series of talks on machine learning in production. So I bring more people and then they can talk about details or about something that's specific to some kind of problem uh, or some industry or what they are doing. I, I, I can also think about inviting some people for a panel. So uh, if you are doing machine learning in production a lot, then hit me up in email, then I might host you on a panel or, or in a uh, further talk. And then uh, my contact is actually at the end of this. So the best is shoot me an email. Okay. <coughs> All right. And then I, I will kind of time it. So I, I will try to be ready in like 50 minutes from right now. Um, so what's this? We have uh, some data, usually the data is like raw data means that it's in some database or maybe in a CSV file or maybe in a data warehouse or maybe in some big data system like HDFS. And the first thing to do is we do feature engineering. So. What this means is that, let's say, the raw data is clicks and the log files from those clicks on the web server, and we want to do some machine learning, predicting some behavior of users. So we need to take out of this raw data and create some kind of features for users. So we might count clicks or some other things based on domain knowledge we can put into these models. But the point is that uh, most often we, we have this raw data and once we refine it uh, for machine learning or for modeling, this data is going to be more refined, uh, more clean and, and small. So uh, uh, the, 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 the first rant is that uh, after this reduction you uh, you probably don't need distributed computing, but so for this, but for this is like this is more like an ETL kind of thing. So uh, uh, for a lot of people, this kind of operational databases like MySQL, Postgres might not cut it. So you want something like an analytical database, like most people are using lately, Redshift, or Vertica, or so those kind of databases, or or maybe Spark. So. So this is very kind of this uh, ETR kind of heavy data processing and you, you take all this large data and you, you refine it into basically a clean data matrix. <coughs> and this, this whole process is very uh, iterative, very researchy, exploratory. So uh, this is one thing that uh, developers coming to data science has kind of, have kind of hard time to understand. It's very it's very difficult to estimate the, 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 how long it's going to take your project because you're doing all this exploratory research thing on, on, on most problems. Okay? And feel free to interrupt with any questions or any comments. So if you think I, I'm talking shit, then uh, say whatever you want. So we can make it interactive so that we kind of learn uh, from each other. 
So, um, so in, in general, so that part, so we are at that upper part, right? So we feature engineer, we get this data matrix. And then, uh, uh, one, one thing there is uh, also I want to touch a little bit is um, a lot of business data is categorical variables. So you have, let's say, countries or something like that. And then uh, a lot of machine learning models, algorithms, and especially their implementation, they cannot deal with this. So you need to do some kind of encoding to numeric, one hot encoding or something like that. So I think the biggest thing to remember there is, so first, try to use a tool that is doing it uh, under the hood and you don't need to do it. That's the, the best, so be as lazy as possible. And then, uh, if that doesn't work, then, uh, uh, especially if you have a lot of categorical um, values, then, uh, then use some kind of sparse representation. So, uh, if, if you, when you do the one-hot encoding, you use a dense matrix, uh, you might use 10, 100 times more memory, and actually it's, it's going to also slow down many of the implementations. It might slow down by 10, 100 times if uh, you're not using a, a sparse representation. So sparse means that, right, so we, in one-hot encoding, we're mapping all this categorical variables into basically zeros and ones. So we have a huge matrix with a lot of zeros and maybe just 1% of the values are ones. So sparse representation would just uh, basically tell you where are the ones. So it will use less memory and it will actually be faster. Okay, so th this is, we kind of done with this uh, boring uh, ETL. Uh, kind of thing, and now we can go to the sexy machine learning. So, um, w once you get there, you probably your data is not terabytes anymore, or definitely not petabytes. So, uh, uh, my, I, I, I have a very strong view against big data. I've been saying that for, for many, many years. For many years, I've been considered like crazy, but uh, I see now that a lot of people are just uh, basically doing machine learning on one, one big server. And, and memory has increased faster than the data sets of most people. So if you do, I don't know, random forest GBM on a couple of million records, then, or even 10 million or 100 million, then uh, you can easily use uh, for that one server. So I want to just quick raise on hands. How many of you have ever done supervised learning that's not linear? So let's say random forest, GBM, I don't know, neural networks, support vector machines on more than a billion records. Yeah, nobody. On more <laughs> one? Mm. More than a billion? So I'm missing it. So nobody. More than a hundred million records. Okay, one, two, three. And then, uh, yeah, that's my usual estimate. About like two, three percent of people, more than a hundred million. And then one, more than ten million. Yeah, a lot more. Yeah, that's very common. So uh, there were at least, I don't know, ten people. So I have to tell you, I, so probably the biggest type. That means uh, 10 million records, or a little bit more, but less than 100 million. So, uh, don't, don't be ashamed of yourself if you don't have big data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, w once you... Uh, w w once you realize that uh, you can do it on one machine, then... then you, you will see which, which libraries would, would be just good enough for you and actually they are faster and more efficient than the big data ones. Um, so, uh, and, and the algo you're gonna 
you the algo you're gonna choose it might also depend on the so you might you might have 10 million records for a project but you might work in another project where you have a couple of thousand of observations because they are more, maybe some kind of aggregates of, of you do machine learning on some groups and let's say you have I don't know 10 million users but you have just a thousand client or partners or whatever you, you can have and then you do machine learning on those guys so in that case you cannot even use uh, any of the fancy <coughs> Vandal Forest or GPMs you might need to fall back to like linear model, logistic regression, linear regression so okay don't be ashamed of using like linear regression, logistic regression for that all the others might just uh, uh, overfit so, the other thing I kind of feel strongly about uh, is that uh, you probably should use just open source as most people. So, the, uh, I started to use open source software. Uh, I, I moved from MATLAB basically to R uh, in 2006. And it was not about the cost, it was just that it had some features like the data frame that I kind of wanted and also it was at that time getting better and now it's way better so uh, we did several surveys and there are several surveys online so uh, most people are using R or Python for machine learning it's kind of like 50-50 or maybe a little bit more for Python but if you look at data science in general it's kind of like 50-50 so uh, there are so many commercial products and uh, I know it's so open source for some reason R and Python they have uh, uh, way bigger communities so uh, meetups, conferences, books, uh, blog posts and all those things so I'm pretty sure if I was running like a SaaS user meetup here there would be like five people showing <laughs> So s somehow uh, open source get, got so big in the last couple of years that uh, and, and it's, it's good quality so it's not like it's free and it's, uh, it's, it's bad quality and uh, most of the good machine learning uh, packages that come up lately uh, the developers they, they know that uh, most people are using R or Python, so the way they do it, they create an R package wrapper and a Python package wrapper. So you can install it in either R or Python and, and just use it as any ordinary package or library. And they are written in C++ or, or sometimes in, in, in Java. So one thing I would really <laughs> advise against if you are doing data science and machine learning for a company then don't write your own implementation, don't implement your own algorithm it's, it's gonna suck, it's not gonna be <laughs> so there are these open source packages who have been written by a lot of people they have been tested all over the years so all the bugs came out, there is a lot of tuning and optimization that have been done in them some of them they are still pretty bad <laughs> some of them are, are, are good but uh, the chance that you're gonna write something that's gonna blow out of the water all the other packages, it's kind of removed. So if you if you like a machine learning researcher working on new algorithms, yeah, do research and then implement your own algorithms and compare it to all the others. But if you are on the this kind of applied side, then it's just easier to, to pick open source packages that are used by a lot of people, are well tested, and then uh, your, your job is not to create something better, it's just to pick up those and with very little time uh, create some models and, and put them into production and create value for, for your company. Um, so the, 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 yeah, the name of the game there in this kind of training, tuning, modeling business is uh, uh, first to avoid overfitting and then uh, one way to do is uh, 
regularization uh, and the other is to, to tune the algorithms to play with the hyperparameters so that you, you get better accuracy um, and you you need uh, you need an unbiased evaluation so that's why it's split it into train test or if you're doing model selection train validation test or do cross validation um, now if you are doing this kind of search for a good model in hyperparameter search some people are calling it um, a lot of people were doing grid search but uh, a way more efficient way to do uh, hyperparameter search for good model in hyperparameter space uh, is actually random search so random search means that uh, uh, it's just like the grid but instead of doing every combination, you just pick randomly out of the grid points. And uh, uh, the reason why this works better is that if you have, let's say you have 10 tuning parameters, it's going to be, grid is going to be a lot of combinations. And uh, uh, most of the times, the the accuracy as a function of the hyperparameters is very flat in most, most of these parameters. So usually it's like a very small two, three dimensional space. So usually it depends really strongly on like one or two or maybe three parameters out of the ten. So by taking uh, all these other values for the other parameters, you're kind of wasting time. Uh, and random search is way more efficient in uh, uh, finding a good solution. Yes, question. Uh, do you have an opinion on things that are between those two? So there's things like genetic algorithms or simulated annealing and things like this that are kind of random and also optimizing. Yeah, so yeah, I, I will talk about a little bit about Bayesian optimization, which is probably what you want to do. So uh, random search is very hard to beat. So uh, uh, there is a good paper that kind of compares random search to grid search and explain all this kind of things what I was talking about. So if you're interested, look that up. Um, a lot of people are trying to do this kind of Bayesian optimization and, and doing things like genetic algorithms and other things. So it's a lot of engulfing processes. It's a lot of work. And uh, you, you barely get a little bit better than random search. So take again the lazy approach, just, I don't know. Uh, so in this paper, uh, it's basically they're comparing all those things with twice random search, meaning that they let random search to run twice as much computing power, and usually twice as much random search will beat at every of the sophisticated algorithms. So all you need to have is twice as much computing CPUs or servers. And uh, this is the one thing that you can distribute because it's embarrassingly parallel, right? So you can do the, if you do random search, you can do the, uh, you can split the high parameter tuning the learning on, on different nodes. So this is kind of the thing where I'm not against distributed computing uh, for machine learning. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, ensembles. So with ensembles you can, I didn't even talk about models, but so basically the models that there are a few papers comparing the accuracy of models, so usually on a lot of data, uh, random forest, gradient boosting, neural networks, and support vector machines come up at the top. Sometimes linear regression on high dimensionality problems. Uh, so, there are hundreds of people coming up with new techniques and new machine learning models and algorithms and implementations every year but uh, if you just know this four or five you, you're pretty good so you, you, you're likely beating all the others or 
you are almost there and it's not you have to you, you have to think about how much work you have to do or you're willing to do to get a little bit bigger accuracy right it depends on the size of your companies if I don't know that 0 0.001 uh, more in AUC it means you multiply it with 10 billion dollars then yeah do it but uh, unless you work for one of those three or four companies you, it's probably not worse so I think in this respect a little bit of Kaggle as kind of like it creates false impression what's important uh, for learning in, or, uh, in order to do machine learning so I have too many rants on Kaggle but the main <coughs> rant is basically that that you win if you manage to get 0, 0, 0. 0. 0.0001 better than the other ones which in practice probably doesn't really matter and usually you get this much better than the others by doing 10 times more work so you have to do the cost-benefit analysis um, the other thing is that a lot of people so basically if you if you go to a course or read the textbook machine learning you always see this kind of evaluation based on mean squared error or based on the ROC curve or AUC but what really matters for business is this dollars mm. that's, that's all they care, my boss doesn't care about AUC Right, so Money. what what you in, in in like when you put a model in production, the best metric to evaluate is how much more money is gonna make that model versus if you don't have the model. So I would say let's say dollars, kind of like marginal or incremental value added by the machine learning model versus if you don't have it. And you you can think of every improvement also. So. If I'm gonna spend 100 hours tuning my model to be a little bit better, how much more money is gonna make? I know it sounds pretty anti-academia and anti-research. I have a PhD, so I've done that part too. But in business, you have you have to satisfy your boss and other people. So yes. So question. money does make the world go around. What? So money does make the world go around. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um. So that that's the I'm not sure if this has a pointer. Yeah, so so basically I've seen few people evaluating this. And it's not that difficult. So let's say if you have a binary classification, then you would look at the false positives and two positives and play with the thresholds. And then you just need some kind of graph estimate of what's the cost of a false positive, what's the cost of a false negative, and what's the benefit of a true positive, right? So, it doesn't need to be exact, but if you're doing nothing, then you, it's still better to do something, to have like a rough estimate. Um, okay, so uh, if I can rent on this part a little bit more would be about uh, machine learning in the cloud how many of you have used uh, Amazon machine Amazon has AWS has a like machine learning product one two three you're gonna hate me four how many of you have used Google's uh, machine learning in the cloud that's basically the tensorflow on yeah one two and what about Microsoft Azure? Oh. Okay, one. <laughs> I don't know. Two? Yeah. Try it out. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I kind of so what what these guys have been doing is uh, kind of amazing in marketing. But um, so let let's go piece by piece. So. Uh, uh, and all of them have great people. So actually, I, I know some of the people who work on these things so I, I happen to know the, the people managing that product in Microsoft and then Amazon has now Alex Smola, a very famous guy uh, 
a good hook on uh, kernels and he's really great so uh, he's now responsible as far as I know to, on, on machine learning on the cloud but so I looked at uh, Amazon uh, on machine learning so first it only has logistic regression and no kidding mm -hmm. so no random forest, no GPM, not even neural networks they, they've been talking that they will add deep learning basically they will build something on top of NXNet that was one of the reasons they hired Alex Mola but still it's just logistic regression so the other thing I kind of benchmarked it versus Volpa Wabit H2O it's about a thousand times slower so no kidding <laughs> So, I, I cannot believe it. So, forget about uh, that. And then they charge you a hell of a lot of money for scoring. So, for every, you can do scoring in real time, and they, you have to pay. So, you, you can do all that on a laptop, and you're better off. So, Google, I had really great respect of Google for, for many years, because they didn't jump on the hype of machine learning. Uh, unfortunately, they did not so long ago, so now they are talking about machine learning in the cloud, all, that's all you need and um, what, what they have is basically, the only model they have is deep learning, it's TensorFlow so okay, you can do logistic regression, but you can hardly do like random forest or GDMs which usually be deep learning on a lot of business problems so, and they, but, so they were very decent in talking about machine learning in like a kind of non hypey way up to a couple of months ago and now they, they, they completely lost their minds so and uh, on Microsoft so I've been a Unix and then Linux user for I don't know 25 years so I always hated Microsoft but I have to acknowledge that actually probably out of the three guys Microsoft has kind of the the, the less bad machine learning in the cloud product so it's kind of like I don't really like this kind of GUI products so uh, you can click through and then build models but uh, it's, it's, it's more complete so they have uh, all these models like random forest, GPM uh, they have all of it uh, but I, I didn't really Played extensively, so I don't know the performance on those. Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, you know, the image analytics. Uh -uh. Oh yeah, yeah, that's another. I would say that. So I, I really like the cloud. I absolutely like the cloud for this kind of basic infrastructure that you spin up a server and then you, let's say, a Linux box. I use that all the time, right? And it's now super easy to to get two terabytes of RAM on an Amazon instance so I'm not against the cloud so for basic infrastructure I love it but all this other like software as a service or, or, or platform as a service they build uh, like Amazon is very incomplete uh, Google is TensorFlow and Microsoft is GUI, I, I don't really like it. And then there is on another you know, on another level there is this kind of like image recognition API and those kind of things that I didn't really I don't use it for work, so it's not that much interest to me, but that might make more sense because computer vision, if a company figures out, it can be useful for a lot of others because a cat will be a cat for any company but when you do machine learning uh, it's still if you want to have good predictions let's say in a business contest, context then like a company I don't know doing credit card processing will be very different from a model a machine learning model for a company doing manufacturing so you would have to do your own feature engineering so there is much room for using the same models or the same uh, basically the, the same algorithms and uh, 
So there, there is more room in reusing things if someone creates really a good image recognition something then for, for that probably it makes more sense to have like an API and it be in the cloud. But um, so there is this guy Bradford um, class who uh, published a blog post and one part of the post I really like it. It says that uh, machine learning in the cloud has been failing for 10 years and it's going to fail again and the reason is because uh, people who know what they are doing so I'm kind of coding almost uh, people who know what they are doing they are using open source hmm. and uh, he says that there is two markets the, the, the market for knowledgeable for the competent people they are going to use open source for machine learning they don't want to build their own machine learning thing. By the way, it's a couple of lines of code, so it's not a big deal to do all this. Uh, and there is the incompetent market who will try to use this API and it's not going to work because that's still hard. So it's, it's not calling the API that's, that's hard, but the statistics behind it, understanding the problem and solving the problem. So. That, that's his uh, view and I, I, I think it's kind of my view too. So, um, where are we? Okay, uh, model evaluation. <coughs> oh, well, yeah, one, th one thing you need to be very careful here is also data leakage. And actually that might come from here, so. Uh, Anyone has heard, everyone knows what's data leakage? So basically that's when somehow in your model you are putting data from the future and that's obviously is not going to work in, in production. And it's very easy to, let's say in a database you don't have timestamps or accurate timestamps or in some tables you don't have timestamps, you, you might easily leak information from the future. Uh, yeah, I kind of have to cut on many of these things in order to kind of finish tonight. So, let me, okay, let's go. So, I'm going to try to keep all the controversial parts, so to be, to be mostly entertaining. So, let's go to deployment. So, a lot of people are talking that in, they have a, like a data science team and they have an engineering team and they saw the, so this is the wall. So they throw the model over the wall, and that's the kind of the deployment. Don't take it, don't mess us. So what what I would say is, uh, I, w I think the best is if you have like some kind of team with sub teams with people that know a little bit about the other parts as well. So. Um, uh, there are a lot of ways how to do scoring and uh, different tools have different approaches and different people have different approaches. Uh, so things that I don't really like is if a data science team is developing a model and then the, the uh, engineering team is re-implementing the scoring. So let's say you create a model in R or Python and the engineering team is uh, kind of hand coding it in Java or C++, the code scoring, or, or in, maybe in SQL, I've heard of that. <laughs> or, or maybe in something called PMML, which is like a so-called open standard, but it's, it's not really an open and it's not a standard either. <laughs> so, uh, there are all these edge cases they don't they don't take care and uh, like for instance the precision of the coefficients is it a flop is it a double so that's not really specified and and different implementers they, they use different so uh, you you just you, you just introduce a lot of bugs but by so if, if your engineering team is going to re-implement the model in Java or C++, the first is a lot of source for, for potential bugs. It's hard to maintain, it's hard to change models, hard to move. So 
the best is to use tools that kind of uh, the, 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 the developers of the tool that's doing the training they kind of provide like an export to something uh, kind of uh, basically feature and that, that, then you can kind of hope for minimizing minimizing the, the bug so look, yeah. the best example of what you said like what would be a good you know approach or like a name of a product or something that you can use. yeah that's what I try to avoid <laughs> <laughs> to to kind of uh, suggest products and sound uh, pitchy, but there are, there are many of the open source uh, uh, tools uh, or packages that if you let, look at some of my other GitHub repositories, then you, you can find those and then you can make your choice. So I have like a benchmark, you can look it up there. Um, but the, the benchmark is, in, is for production stuff? The benchmark is just for training. Yeah. But basically for solving that one problem. So I wanted to yeah. So unfortunately I just have an hour, so I I have so many other things to say that are <coughs> still the same. Yeah, I know it's all I say now is very high level, so uh, but I think some of the things might be important. So we can have other talks where either I or many others who are doing this, they can talk about pieces or <coughs> go into products and, and trade-offs and those kind of things. But I want this to be kind of like a first talk in a series maybe, and then uh, I would want to finish it and keep it high level. Yes, question? Yeah, I, I think it'd be good if you could not, not if you don't have time today, but maybe mm -hmm. in a future talk, kind of elaborate a little bit more between the open source package mm -hmm. library deployment versus oh. the commercial or public APIs. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a big struggle in the developer community right now. Yeah. And I think we're seeing the developer community they gravitate more and more towards the commercial APIs. So if you have like a strong feeling that yeah. the open source packages are better, it'd be mm -hmm. great we could like have some sort of like uh, benchmarking presentation yeah. that says, here's what we deployed, here's what it looks like on yeah. TensorFlow versus an R package. And that actually it would be nice to bring other people, so if you are doing really machine learning in production, please email me. And then, uh, because I might have some opinions, uh, and some other people have other opinions, and it's nice to hear different angles or opinions. Uh, because for different problems, uh, some different approaches might, might, might work better. But in summary, I would say open source is, even if, maybe I shouldn't say it's better than all the others, but at least it's as good as the others. So I, I don't know of many commercial products that are better than the open source. So I would say there is open source, there is commercial, and I would put this machine learning in the cloud API kind of things as like separate that category of Amazon machine learning, uh, Google's hosted TensorFlow, and and the, the Azure. Uh, I would again uh, code, I repeat that code that people who know what they are doing they are using open source. All right. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I would like to have more talks and, and, and comparing products and those kind of things. Uh, all right, here is one, uh, oh yeah, and uh, so when you do this, you can do batch scoring, you can do real-time scoring, uh, it's been almost like suggested by blog posts and literatures that uh, basically you always want real time and you want it as a REST API and you want it scalable and uh, uh, it's, I don't think it's necessary too so if you don't have a lot of requests and, and it doesn't matter if you take 
if you don't take action on something uh, in real time, then it's just easier to have a patch. So, true. So, basically, in all these things, I'm kind of suggesting to keep things as simple as possible, try to reduce complexity, and uh, be lazy. So, reduce your work, reduce complexity. Complexity will reduce your future work and will reduce trouble. Uh, so, real time is this kind of uh, uh, basically REST API, and then you have uh, some, some, like web service serving the scores. That is that every minute or every hour or every day you're running something on live data. So, uh, there is a big difference between the servers you need here and the servers you need here. Uh, so, what you need here is a lot of RAM, a lot of cores uh, in order to train. Most of these models are very CPU intensive, trainings run around for hours on like few million of data points even. Uh, and you, you need, if you have more cores, in general it's better, but not always. Uh, and you, you, you need RAM usually. And here what you need for scoring is kind of different. Is, is you can get away with little RAM or core. It's, it's more this kind of, some people are concentrating more on this kind of high availability. But you don't need a lot of computational power here uh, usually. So scoring, what you need is, if you need real time, you probably need it fast. So it matters what's the latency, and uh, when you score is embarrassingly parallel, right? So every single instance you score is it's, uh, uh, it's independent of the others. So you can just throw in more servers, put the load balancer in front of them, and uh, that will uh, scale it up to, uh, to a larger throughput. But you still need need low la latency. So, if you're doing real time, you might want to have. So, if a, if you give something to a user, then you probably want something of a few hundred milliseconds or lower. Um, but in some applications, you might have even more stringent, like ten milliseconds or whatever. But uh, some of the tools are pretty good. So, if you do like random forest or, or GBM, then you have to score a lot of trees, then those might get, in some tools, they might be slow, uh, but there are tools that are, are fast, so I can get, I don't know, 100 trees within 15-20 milliseconds with some of the tools, uh, which I will definitely include in the next one. I would argue that REST API is just for... <coughs> Yes? It helps, like, especially that wall. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you want to get yes, yeah. it lets you separate data science. Now. Yeah. Okay, so actually, yeah. So the next point is one thing that I couldn't really solve, and, uh, uh, and it's kind of related to that in a little bit. So uh, I, I think this is the easiest part. So one of the Annoying things in this is that um, when you do feature engineering here, you usually do it in a big data or in an analytical system. And you, when you are here, your live data is coming from an operational database. And then you can, you, sh you have to kind of replicate whatever you did here, here to create the inputs. And I don't really know how to do it well, because basically this is code duplication, which is evil, right? It's the root of all evil in computer science. And uh, there is a Google paper that probably many of you have seen. is called uh, uh, Machine Learning, the High Interest uh, uh, Depth, Credit Card Depth. And, uh, it's kind of talking about this problem and a few others, and I, it doesn't seem to me like they have a solution. So, uh, 
So what the Google paper talks about is that machine learning is uh, introducing a lot of dependencies and it couples systems and this, this is one of the annoying coupling that basically when you do here some feature engineering then uh, you have it in your data warehouse or something and then you need to do it here as well. So I'm not sure if is this annoying for other people as well? Do we have a solution? So API is kind of, but to a so if you have the this API, then uh, if you have it real time, you still have to compute the inputs. So it helps a little bit in decoupling, but it's not. I don't think it solved the problem. Yeah. Microservices for the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And you can actually use it because you're just calling calling the API. Yeah, you you do it here, but and then you would have to do it. Here as well, probably, right? So you do it there first, and then when you deploy it, it's usable by both. No, okay. Or just write the two components in the same language and pull out a common library. Mm. Yeah. All right, so maybe you guys want to talk about this next. <laughs> <laughs> should, should be an email. Um, so, one, one thing you can, and then, um, a lot, uh, so a lot of people, they are stopping here, so uh, you saw where the wall, they deploy those things, and there is live data coming in, and then we get the scores, and we are done. And then, uh, what, what I think is very important is then, what you do with the scores. So, uh, and I've seen very few people talk about this part. Uh, and I think it's super important. So you get the scores, and then, uh, again, what matters for business is how much money it's going to make, or how much more value, customer satisfaction, or whatever it, it, it will make. So sometimes it's not dollars, but some kind of abstract value. And then, uh, so when you deploy, you, you can start to do action. It's very nice to do some kind of A-B testing of splitting your things into two parts where on one part you take action, on the other part you just don't take action as if you didn't have a machine learning model and then you, you compare the two. And then I think you, you kind of need two things. So you need the... Uh, you need this kind of constant monitoring of the scoring and of the action and what was the result of the action. So this would be this. Uh, so what I like to have is I would like to have dashboards with graphs uh, having some of the most important metrics like distribution of scores and those kind of things. And I also like to have some kind of email or text alerts to if something breaks, some condition fails, then I want to get some kind of alert so that I don't need to watch these graphs uh, all the time. And then this evaluation is a little bit different. So uh, one thing that might happen is that when you when you, you train a model and then the way you do it is, let's say you split your data set into train and test. You train the model and you test it on the test set and then let's say you have an AUC uh, on uh, the test set here. Or maybe you do cross-validation. But very often you deploy and I think you should also evaluate the live model, how it performs. And you would expect that here, if you evaluate on these things, it will be exactly the same as on the test set. But it's not necessary. So, so uh, things might change. So distribution change. It's only in the test book that you have a training set and test set that they have exactly the same distribution. So in life, things change in time, right? So models will degrade in time because of non-stationarity.
things will change. So, also if you do evaluation here on the live data, you might be able to find bugs. You also might be able to detect data leakage. So, if you do this kind of cheating here with data from the future uh, or inadvertently, you, 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 you use data that you shouldn't use and you, you get a great model here, you deploy, you will, if you have data leakage, you will see that it's not going to work here. So, so doing this simulation is kind of on, on, on the live data, it's kind of very important in many aspects versus just like doing it here. So that's why it's kind of hard to have here a split of the team and this is the data science team, this is the engineering. So the best is to kind of, so you, people doing this and especially this need to have the knowledge of training or doing modeling. So I don't know how, I don't care how you're doing it, it's like one team with some teams and but, but some, somehow, or just good communication, but, but somehow these this things have to be like, you have to be able to communicate to understand each other. Yeah. So, uh, you warned us against using vendor algorithm training solutions, and I don't disagree. Yeah. By which I mean I agree. But, you, uh, what do you think of vendors that sell this whole diagram as a package, mm -hmm. but it's silent to allow you to access and deploy open source? So yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't really see any vendor selling the whole thing, uh, especially, the, so, so well, well, in their marketing material, of course, but, but when you look it in real time, it's, it's, it's not really true. Uh, my, by the way, my friend who is not here, is also selling this <laughs> as if it was the solution for everything. Most people know who I'm talking about. Um, but so, so I, I think this is hard to package into a solution because it's very business dependent and domain dependent. So maybe that's why nobody really figured it out. So I think most vendors they cover some part of it. So maybe this, so but there are a lot of vendors covering like 20% of this and claiming that they do 80% of it but uh, yeah, so it's kind of like uh, the best thing to do is if you have good enough people who can put this together with open source tools which is not actually hard, so uh, you don't even have to write a lot of code, I would say that uh, use those tools that have so I don't like GUIs because they are not really flexible enough but on the on the, the uh, tools where you have to write code I like to write as little code as possible and to have the tool taken care of as much as possible because it's then I first I don't have to do so much work <laughs> but then also it's easier to maintain and they can do a lot of optimizations under the hood if you just I don't know. So training should be one line of code or at least one function call. So each and then one hot encoding shouldn't be like twenty lines of code. <laughs> that used to be the case with let's like, say Spark. Let's see, yeah, I'm kind of skipping a lot of things. Um, <coughs> so there is, a, there is an open source framework, John Mora is not here. He used to be, he used to run the machine learning meetups at New Harmony, now he's at Zephyr. Uh, so they, he developed, maybe him and some other guy at New Harmony, they developed an open source framework called Aloha that's also doing some part of this. Uh, I think he was talking about that at one of the meetups within the last year. He, I would invite him on a panel if I do a panel, definitely. 
Um,
kind of the so if you want a benchmark on which open source tools are the best uh, for machine learning on 10 million records, then look at this GitHub repo. Um, deep learning is not really good for every business problem, so actually on many data sets like uh, gradient boosting is beating deep learning and you can see that in Kaggles that basically XGBoost wins about two thirds of the competitions and deep learning about a third uh, so it depends on the problem uh, yeah AI I didn't even I didn't even say the, the term AI I really hate it so it's yeah we had we are calling now logistic regression AI. <laughs> so, yeah, why not call it still machine learning? And then, okay, here is the this thing. Uh, and then, I some of my rants on Kaggle. And then, okay, here is the my contact. So, uh, email me if you have any further questions or you want to get involved in one of the next talks or panels or anything like that. So, thank you. I want to ask our host, can we still hang out here a little bit?